This video is sponsored by the leading password manager, Dashlane. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. In March 2019, archaeologists in central China's Henan province were excavating the tomb of a noble family from the Western Han Dynasty when they discovered an ancient bronze pot filled with a mysterious liquid. It smelled distinctly like liquor, so the researchers assumed it was the last remnants of some kind of wicked homebrew. Luckily for them, they resisted the temptation to do a few celebratory shots, because further analysis confirmed the fluid was mainly made up of potassium nitrate, which these days you'll mostly find in agricultural supplements, rocket fuel, and fireworks and alienite, a mineral modern folks like you are more likely to put on your garden than in your Friday afternoon sundowner. So what on earth were posh people 2000 years ago doing drinking liquid fertilizer? Simple, they were trying to live forever. The recipe for this concoction came from an ancient religious text that described the makings of an elixir of immortality and was part of a Chinese tradition of alchemy thought to go back some 3,000 years. The Yellow Emperor, a mythical leader who ruled China from about 2700 BC, is said to have achieved immortality and ascended to heaven, partly thanks to his ingestion of a magical potion. Admittedly, the same guy was reputed to ride around in an ivory chariot drawn by dragons and surrounded by flocks of phoenixes, so I'll forgive you if you're feeling a little skeptical. But until as recently as the 18th century, this story was serious business. Alchemists dedicated their lives to discovering the secrets of immortality, mostly in service of emperors who fancied their chances of becoming gods. According to the 24 Histories, the official books of Chinese history, at least 10 emperors either died, went insane, or were permanently incapacitated thanks to drinking immortality elixirs or taking pills, most of which contained ingredients like mercury and arsenic, which, far from making you live forever, dramatically decreased the odds of you seeing out the day. Naturally, this madness wasn't only happening in China. In the Middle East and the West, the alchemical legend of the Philosopher's Stone, a substance that could grant eternal life and turn base metals into gold, dates back millennia. Some even say it was handed to Adam by God himself. Buddhism and Hinduism also contain tales of a magical wish-fulfilling jewel called the Kintamani Stone, which is said to convey immortality. Taken with a pinch of metaphorical salt, these different traditions suggest a human notion of living forever has been around about as long as notions themselves. Even the Epic of Gilgamesh, a 4,000-year-old Mesopotamian script regarded as the earliest surviving piece of literature, is essentially the story of one guy's search for immortality and the friends he meets along the way. It's like Disney, but on clay tablets. The fact is, humans have been scared to death of death for as long as we've been conscious of it, and we've created endless myths and legends describing immortals or people who've managed to dodge the Grim Reaper. For those of us knee-deep in the 21st century, stories of alchemists brewing up toxic nightcaps may sound ludicrous. But you have to wonder if we've really changed all that much since those days, because the topic of immortality is hotter now than it's ever been before, and some people claim they've already made it possible. Companies have been around for years, selling cryogenic services that allow you to have your head or entire body frozen when you die, on the assumption the technology needed to revive you will be developed at some point in the future. Although, of course, what we're really talking about there isn't so much immortality as resurrecting the dead. Thawing out human popsicles and giving them the full Frankenstein's monster treatment. Which would be some serious technology indeed. Perhaps more plausible, if we can call it that, is the suggestion that the human mind could be uploaded into digital form. 
And whilst that also sounds pretty out there, some people claim we'll achieve this unbelievable feat within the next three decades. This is the hope of transhumanists, people who believe science will provide a way for us to transcend our physical limitations and access cyber immortality. We may not yet have cyber immortality, but at least you can have rock solid cyber security with Dashlane, who've kindly sponsored today's video. Dashlane creates strong and unique passwords for all of your online accounts and also fills them so you never have to click forgot password ever again. And you don't have to sweat about the extremely rare chance that Dashlane could be breached because Dashlane safely stores and decrypts your data on your local device only using your master password. This means that Dashlane never has access to your personal data and any hacker would only see random noise. Dashlane also also fills your credit card information whilst online shopping so you can make purchases without having to fetch your wallet. Dashlane has a built-in VPN to encrypt your data and keep your online activity anonymous. Best of all, it works on any device. Whether you're protecting your plans for a top secret artificial intelligence or just videos of your cat, there's no better way to make sure your online world is impenetrable than by using Dashlane. From my experience, Dashlane is the best, all bases covered, security and time-saving tool out there. You can try Dashlane for free on your first device by heading to www.dashlane.com forward slash 42. Then, if you decide you want to upgrade to premium, use my code 42 for 10% off. The idea of uploading your brain to a computer, including all your thoughts, feelings and memories, is called whole brain emulation. And surprisingly enough, it's not a particularly new concept. Similar ideas have been the fodder of science fiction writers for almost a hundred years, with legendary author Arthur C. Clarke describing a city one billion years in the future in which citizens exist as data patterns in the city's central computer. Clarke wrote that book, The City and the Stars, in 1956. But the reason we're having this conversation today is that rapid advances over the last few decades in fields like nanotechnology, biotech and artificial intelligence have got people wondering with some genuine interest, could we upload our brains and live forever? And if we could, how would we do it? And what would life look like? Of course, once we've answered all those little chestnuts, the bigger question that remains is, should we? One person who seems to have answers to all of these questions is Ray Kurzweil, an American inventor and futurist. There's a moniker that gets thrown around a lot these days, futurist. In the past, we used to call them fortune tellers and make them sit in caravans with crystal balls. But these days, we give them book contracts and consultancy packages. Anyway, even from this slightly cynical starting point, there does seem to be something a bit different about Kurzweil. Firstly, he's a genuine visionary and credible inventor, and is a past recipient of the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, the United States' highest honour in technology. He's also been making predictions about the future for some time, with well-known examples being nanotechnology, e-books, face recognition software, and a computer beating a human at chess by the year 2000. By 2009, Kurzweil had made 108 predictions, of which he claims 89 were absolutely accurate, with another 13 partially correct or set to be absolutely correct within a few years. So he's developed a bit of a reputation as someone who should be listened to when it comes to developments of the future, and the development Kurzweil is most passionate about is the singularity. The technological singularity is a theoretical point in time when technology will develop superintelligence that allows it to upgrade itself at an exponential rate, making it increasingly smarter than us. Kurzweil says we humans will then merge our intelligence with machine intelligence and basically become super beings. And 
All of this will happen by the year 2045. A key reason he thinks all this will be possible is because by the 2030s, he believes we humans will have transcended the need for physical bodies and learned to upload our brains to computers along with our personalities, skills, and personal histories. Kurzweil appears to be genuinely convinced he's going to become immortal and takes more than 200 pills a day to ensure he lives long enough to see the technology that will turn him into a digital mini-me. And he's not the only one. Russian billionaire Dmitry Itzkov has stated he's 100% positive he can make humans immortal by 2045 by uploading people to artificial brains. These brains could then be dropped into robots or projected as living holograms. Or you could simply be uploaded into the cloud where you could live out your eternal life in a 3D simulation of bliss and bottomless digital pina coladas. But for any of this to happen, we need to get a few important things right. The first being the ability to scan the entire human brain to create something called the connectome, a 3D map of the brain showing every neuron and molecule within. There are big questions about whether this would ever be possible. The brain is an insanely complex piece of machinery that we don't really understand all that well. Yes, even mine. So far, scientists have only been able to map the connectome of one creature, a one millimeter round worm which has a total of 302 neurons in its entire nervous system. By comparison, a fruit fly, or ant, has about 250,000 neurons. A mouse has about 71 million, and the human brain has 86 billion. Today, mapping of the brain relies on technology like MRIs, MEGs, and EEGs, all of which give a partial but incomplete picture by a mile. Other potential scanning methods include electrodes that could be placed directly on the brain, with each electrode capable of mapping thousands of neurons. But as this technique requires cutting open the skull, it's no surprise people aren't exactly queuing up to try it out. But let's say, for argument's sake, you could find someone crazy enough or drunk enough to volunteer for this procedure, and that the operation was even legal. You could hypothetically get a perfect biological image of the brain. But would that represent the person you are? And how would you actually make it run? Would mapping the brain even be enough in the first place? The human heart and gut are also full of millions of neurons that have been shown to affect our moods and state of mind. Would we need to find a way to upload these too? If we go back to the example of the round worm, its connectome was replicated as software and loaded into a Lego robot, which the research team claimed behaved exactly the same as the original worm. It moved towards food and it responded to touch. But the robot exhibited no feelings and didn't even cry at the end of Titanic. So the question of emotional expression remains unanswered. Either way, the human brain mapping exercise would require computer power capable of processing vast amounts of data. Zettabytes, in fact. How big is a zettabyte? Well, if every person living in the year 2000 had had a 180 gigabyte hard drive completely filled with data, all the data on all of those drives would occupy one zettabyte. It's the same amount of data as 200 trillion MP3s. That's a lot of One Direction, and nobody wants that. These days, we have some pretty impressive computers. Take Summit, for example, one of the fastest supercomputers on planet Earth today. To borrow an analogy from the New York Times, if a stadium built for 100,000 people was full, and everyone in it had a modern laptop, it would take 20 such stadiums to match the computing strength of this machine. Summit fills a 9,000 square foot room and has been clocked at just under 2 billion calculations per second. The fastest supercomputer in the world, Fugaku, is almost three times as fast as that. 
But even this kind of obscene technology doesn't even come close to the processing power we would need to create an accurate virtual copy of the brain. It may be that quantum computers can step up to the plate for us on this one, but we're still trying to figure out exactly what they can and can't do for now, and it's hard to say for sure. So yeah, the hows of mind uploading are still yet to be entirely ironed out. But for the sake of argument, let's assume these hurdles will be overcome within the next few decades, and we manage to create true emulations of human brains. What do we do next? As we've already seen, we could pop our digital doppelgangers into robots, or create mechanical versions of ourselves. But that relies on robots evolving fast enough over the coming years for it to be worthwhile. The most advanced robots around at the moment can climb stairs, mix cocktails, and do gymnastics. But they're still nowhere near as agile and adaptable as your average ape, hairless or otherwise. The more likely and probably more affordable scenario for an average person would be the creation of a digital version of you that could be loaded into a simulated virtual reality. This digital world would require the sensory complexity of this one, with the ability to replicate all the ingredients that make up the human experience. Sights, smells, tastes and textures, even emotions and thinking. Yes, we're basically going to have to build the Matrix. But unlike pre-Red Pill Neo, the inhabitants of this world would know full well it wasn't real, in the traditional sense, and that would allow us to code in some serious upsides. You wouldn't experience death or disease unless you wanted to. You could fly, look however you want, be with whoever you want, go wherever you want. Basically, a true fantasy universe, like Ready Player One's Oasis. But running an environment of such complexity would, again, rely on massive computing power. Designing and optimizing it would almost certainly require artificial intelligence of some kind, and creating a continuous, high-quality, believable experience would require giant technological strides forward. For example, the computer game industry has fueled incredible advances in graphics in recent decades, meaning it might be possible to make a digital universe look pretty great in the near future. But for obvious reasons, no real work has been done on how to satisfy the other human senses like smell, touch, and taste in a digital setting. And even assuming we were able to meet the technological demands to build a satisfying and realistic digital afterlife for our uploaded minds, how would that system operate? It would require huge data centers running 24-7 across massive networks in the same way the cloud does now. But just as you have to pay a subscription for your cloud storage each month, you would presumably have to pay for the storage of your virtual self. What if you were no longer able to pay? Would your data be switched off, effectively killing you? It's a system that feels open to abuse too. It's the ultimate monopoly. In the real world, if you don't like the rules where you live, you can move somewhere else. But when your entire universe is owned and managed by the same company or organization, if you don't like it, you're kind of screwed. And nobody wants Mark Zuckerberg as their overlord. Then again, these kinds of challenges only really matter if this digital being is actually you in the first place. Consider for a moment the force experiment known as the Ship of Theseus. If you aren't familiar with this one, just imagine the great Greek hero's vessel was anchored in a bay as a museum relic. But over time, pieces began to rot and were replaced. Gradually, more and more parts of the ship are replaced, until eventually, there are no original pieces left. Would the ship that was now anchored in the harbour still be Theseus's ship? Or is it something different? The force experiment was first posed by Greek philosopher Heraclitus almost 2,500 years ago to highlight the question of identity. Who are you? And it's been bugging philosophers ever since. Let's look at a more contemporary example of the same conundrum. 
When crew aboard the Starship Enterprise used a ship's transporter, their atoms are disassembled in one place and then reassembled in another. If your whole body is dissolved and then your atoms are reassembled somewhere else, is it still you? And if it is you, where are you during the time between departure and arrival, whilst your atoms are separated and drifting through space? There are two basic ways mind uploading could be achieved. The first is the copy and paste approach we've been looking at so far, in which we create a copy of the brain and then upload it to the digital ether. The second method is the copy and delete approach that sees individual neurons in the brain gradually replaced by computer functions until the original organic brain is fully replaced by a computer simulation, just like Theseus's ship. In either case, the question still remains. Is the virtual version of you, well, you? Would we regard it as conscious? Say you were able to create something that was hypothetically identical to you in every way. Same thoughts, feelings, memories, likes, dislikes, weird fantasies about swimming naked in jelly. And then you loaded that creation into a simulated world in the cloud. Who would be you? The simulation or the person in your body or both? The answers to those questions pretty much depend on your perspective. As far as your digital clone is concerned, a moment ago they were a living, breathing human being, and now they're a digital and a mortal super being. Likewise to your friends and family or anyone else looking in from the outside. Your clone would be indistinguishable from you and would therefore be you only digitalized and immortal. So far, so good. But from the final perspective, your own, things look a bit more grim. Just because your brain has been perfectly copied, it doesn't mean your consciousness will magically jump from your body into the computer. In fact, you would go on experiencing the world just as you always did, meaning you would grow old and you would die. And the fact a perfect digital copy of yourself gets to have all the fun flying around in the matrix might not seem like all that much of a consolation. In fact, it might seem like kind of a piss take. Which means that even if we do manage to overcome all the technological, ethical and practical challenges and upload our minds, there are still serious questions to be asked about whether or not that would actually give us the kind of immortality we hoped it would in the first place. There are no simple solutions to these questions, that's why we aren't doing it. Philosophers have been kicking around conundrums about identity for millennia, and we still don't have answers we can all agree on. But perhaps that won't matter. As far as transhumanists are concerned, there's no need to let metaphysics get in the way of progress. Let's build cyber versions of ourselves anyway and see what happens. We can sort out the definitions of words like me and I later. Still, there's no avoiding that in a future reality where uploaded versions of people are regarded as equivalent to physical people, we will still need to answer some really weird ethical questions. For example, will simulated digital versions of people living eternal lives have the same rights and responsibilities as people living in the physical world? How will digital people contribute to society? How will they earn money? Will they even need to? With brain twisters like these to contend with, it's no wonder people like Ray Kurzweil want to plug their minds into computers and access super intelligence. Whether that will be possible remains to be seen. But first, we have to decide whether it's even a good idea. Thanks for watching. And thanks again to Dashlane. Don't forget to check them out using the link below.